One of the things that I realized, you know, just often tracking for my students is when they are falling in and out of scene. And it's interesting because I just taught this very experimental class and thinking about the ways in which you don't always have to be in scene. Of course, you can be in vignettes and you can be doing poetry and there's lots of ways that you can be out of scene and, and times when you should be out of scene. And yet not being in control of your scenes is probably one of the most common mistakes and especially of beginning memoirists and even for people who know a lot more. Uh, one of the things that I realize in my own writing is how easy it is to not be in scene <laughs> because all of a sudden you're just doing prose and you're telling a story and you're not really anchoring the reader in a, in a particular time and place, which is what defines a scene. So uh, I have come up with a couple of examples here just to show the two side by side, not in scene and in scene, because I think it's always helpful to see an example. Here's the out of scene one. Uh, and the reason is just because this is Christmas anytime. So it says Christmas was a time when my mother loved to wallow. For my sister and I, it was a great relief if the neighbors came over bearing some holiday treat. This meant we wouldn't have to bear the full brunt of her sadness during the season. If it was Jim who showed up alone without Claire, my mother's spirits ran high. I would place myself on the staircase and listen to their conversations. My father would be in the basement, but mother didn't care. She openly flirted with Jim, no matter who was around. Everyone's open acceptance of what was happening made it seem normal. And maybe it was the most normal thing, a sad woman on a holiday that reminded her uh, of all of her past griefs coming to life for a man who paid her much more attention than my father ever did. After Christmas was over, mother rushed to clean up all the decorations and no one helped. In fact, I'm sure they were all tucked away by the time we woke up on the morning of the 26th. Done until next year when we'd rinse and repeat, at least mother would come out of her funk. So there's a telling quality to this kind of writing, but I see it all the time, right? Which is this desire to show the reader an experience that often happened but the problem is that this is any Christmas and there has a there is a cadence to the writing that is, you know, this happened and this used to happen and it was this way. Uh, and there's a couple of good moments in here, but it is largely flat and it's very hard to embody this particular space, this particular holiday, because we don't know how old this person is. We don't really know where we are in time and space. It's all Christmases. And so this is a common thing that I see with my writers, which is that they're not anchoring two feet on the ground. They're not getting specific. So by contrast, here's the same scene in scene. Let's read this one. Christmas was a time when my mother loved to wallow. It starts out the same way. <laughs> One relief my sister and I had from her sadness was when Jim and Claire, our next door neighbors, came to visit. The Christmas I was 10, Jim came by on his own, Claire nowhere in sight. My father was tucked in the basement, his usual retreat space. My sister must have been in her room because I stood on the landing of the stairs all by myself, listening as my mother and Jim laughed. It had been weeks since I'd heard anything other than a moan or a sigh escape her lips. Only two more days to go till Christmas. I was counting down the days." Mother always flirted with Jim, but this time the air seemed to crackle with something I didn't understand, but I also didn't know to consider inappropriate between them. After all, wasn't it the most normal thing in the world for a sad woman on a holiday that reminded of her of her past griefs to come to life for a man who paid her much more attention than my father ever did? I went to bed that night wishing that Jim would come and stay with us through Christmas, that we could release him on the 26th when I was used to waking up to all the decorations put away. Mom would rise before we were even up and any evidence that Christmas had just passed would be eradicated. I didn't mind because it meant I'd have my mother back. In fact, I'd give up the whole holiday if it meant I didn't have to witness her sadness anymore. So at the end, we do kind of go into what will happen or what would happen based on what she knows from years past. But what's important to note about this scene is that we are anchored in a time. We do know that this is two days before Christmas, she tells us, two days to go. We know that she's 10. 
She gives us a place to enter into her body and her mind space, which is in when she is standing on the landing of the stairs all by herself. And she speculates about where her sister might be, tells us where her dad is. So all of a sudden, there's a great orientation to where we are in time and space. And this is therefore a very anchored moment. Uh, and so I want to invite all of you to think about this when you're doing your own writing, because uh, one of the things that happens so often is that we're not embodied in the writer, <laughs> you know, and, and as Mary Carr said, and Linda Joy and I talk about this all the time, the, the reader zips themselves up into your skin. And so you have to give them this time and place anchor. Otherwise you're telling your story from a omniscient place. Now, again, there might be time and place for an omniscient narrator, but most of your you and, and most of your books are going to be anchored in a particular time when you're in age and you're in a specific place and you're surrounded by specific people. So hopefully that example shows you, you know, the moment at which you bring in the reader. And obviously those were very short pieces. I had to fit them on a slide, <laughs> but there's much more that can be done in scene. You know, there could have been much more dialogue, much more characterization of the mother of Jim, much more setting, you know, all of those places were lacking, but more than anything, I wanted you to pay attention to when do we know where the narrator is because that is the person that you're essentially standing in for as you read a story and so as writers you want to give your readers someone to stand in for that is you you're inviting them to stand inside of you so you have to have your feet planted on the ground and let your readers know where you are mm -hmm.